Test, test. One, two. Good. The Senate Committee on Energy and Environment is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman McCann? Present. Senator McDonald Rivet? Here. Senator Singh? Present. Senator Baer? Here. Senator Schink? Here. Senator Hertel? Here. Senator Camilleri? Here. Senator Chang? Here. Senator Polhinke? Here. Senator Lowers? Here. Senator DeMoose? Here. Senator Outman? Here. Senator Houck? Senator Bellino? Here. Mr. Chairman, you have 13 members present. There is a quorum. Thank you. Make a motion to excuse absent members. Seeing no objection, absent members are excused. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the March 16, 2023 minutes, meeting minutes made by uh, Vice Chair McDonald Rivet. Without objection, the minutes are adopted. Uh, just as a quick outline of our meeting, we're going to try to keep the time and try to keep it. Um, we have three presenters to come before us today. Michigan Public Service Commission, DTE Energy, and Consumers Energy, and we've allocated approximately 25 minutes uh, to each of those uh, organizations uh, equally, and I'm asking the presenters to try to keep their prepared remarks and presentations as succinct as possible, since I know there are a lot of questions that people want to ask. Uh, so with that said, I um, just want to open up with the topic of the storms. Uh, many people in Michigan suffered greatly due to the effects of the recent ice storms. 
And we all know it's exceedingly frustrating to have these situations repeated and more frequently. This legislature and this committee wants to fix it. That said, we want to first give thanks and gratitude to the thousands of first responders, line workers, and others who helped get the power back on for so many as fast as possible and with great sacrifice to their families and themselves. Again, thank you to them. The citizens of Michigan owe everyone a huge debt of thanks. Unacceptable is by far the most frequently used word to describe the performance of the grid in the wake of the ice storms. Today, this morning, there will not be nearly enough time for us to wrap our arms around all the issues, but it is a start. We'll certainly have more time to work, and we'll certainly have more work to do to, after today, as I expect this will be an ongoing effort to get any time, everywhere, every time service with reasonable rates reestablished in Michigan. The storms and constant outages have laid bare some very crucial issues, and we all owe it to the citizens of Michigan to help achieve better results. But ultimately, we are legislators. We set the standards, but talk must translate into policy. We are empowered to take good ideas and make them into law. And with that, I'd like to start with the chairman of the Michigan Public Service Commission, uh, Mr. Dan Scripps. If you'd please join us, thank you very much for being here today. And please proceed. Thank you, Chairman McCann and members of the committee. Um, appreciate the opportunity to come back. Um, I just want to tee up sort of where, where we were a month and a day ago today. So starting on February 22nd, we had a, a series of three winter storms that moved through Michigan, particularly lower Michigan, uh, resulting in significant outages. Um, the February 22nd ice storm truly was historic, the worst in 50 years, uh, brought two-thirds of an inch um, across uh, much of lower Michigan. Uh, we saw some counties, Hillsdale County in particular, with more than 90% of their customers without power at the, the height of the storm. And uh, notably, it took uh, more than a week to, to restore uh, some of the, the last folks uh, to be brought back. Um, just a couple days later, a bit further north, uh, we saw additional ice uh, that, that led to additional outages. And then on March 3rd, a snowstorm added more than 200,000 additional outages. Many of the same folks who had been without power in the ice storm uh, were again facing the prospect of a cold and dark night um, and uh, the next several days. So it's been busy in terms of the response. Uh, I echo the, the Chairman McCann's thanks to the line workers and first responders who were out there in the worst of the weather uh, to try and bring back people as fast as, as they could, but, but clearly a challenge situation. Um, what we know though is that it's not the first time that this has happened. That when you look at the last 10 years, just that snapshot, we've had at least 16 storms resulting, the, with, uh, re resulting in a quarter million Michiganders uh, losing their power, five of which impacted more than half a million, and at least three storms um, impacting more than a million people. Uh, in many of those cases, it took a week or longer to fully restore those who had been without power. And I'd note that though this is severe weather week and sort of the official beginning of, of Michigan's uh, spring weather and thunderstorm season, these storms have been scattered throughout the year. When you look at that chart, there are nine of the 12 months represented in all four seasons. So we're finding that this extreme weather is happening more often. It can happen in any season uh, with significant impacts in terms of the, the outages it caused. Um, and of course, the outage numbers are only part of the story. Uh, we have seen fatalities on all too regular an occurrence uh, as folks come into contact with the distribution system, including one individual, a volunteer firefighter from Paw Paw in the most recent storm, and last August, a 14-year-old girl in Monroe came into contact with a downed wire in her backyard and tragically lost her life. So these have real human consequences. When the power goes out, it is a dangerous situation, uh, and it is an unacceptable situation, as the chairman mentioned. Notably, these storms, even just in the last 10 years, feature a lot of worst evers or worst in 50 years. I mentioned the ice storm, the windstorm in 2017 that, that, uh, brought, that had more than a million outages was the worst windstorm that we've seen. The summer of 2021, uh, we saw major storm events happening more, more frequently than once a week over the course of the summer. People barely got back on their feet when the next storm front rolled in. 
But if we're getting historic storms essentially every other year, it's hard to say that they're truly historic anymore. I think this is the new normal. And more to the point, Michigan residents don't care about storm trivia. They just know that the power's out, that it's out again, and they want to know when it'll be back on. And I think that's the job that's in front of all of us, is to make sure that even as extreme weather becomes more frequent and more extreme, that we have a grid that can handle the realities of the new normal. So the leading factors impacting reliability, and I think it's the combination of all three of these things, the changing climate, the increasing frequency and severity of storms that we were just talking about, inadequate vegetation management, the deferred maintenance on the, the basics of tree trimming uh, that's causing too many limbs to come into contact with too many wires, and then in aging distribution infrastructure, poles, wires, transformers, substations that need that regular maintenance, upgrading and hardening. And it's the combination of those three things that is resulting in the outage numbers that we're here to discuss this morning. I talked a little bit about this given the time, I, I won't uh, dwell on this, but you can see clear trends in the increasing frequency and severity of storms. In 1960, the average peak wind during a storm event was in the low 30s. Today it's in the high 40s and pushing 50 miles an hour. That's a different set of conditions than the one that the grid was built for. So. Over the last several years, the Commission has taken a number of steps. We know that there's more work to be done, uh, but just to quickly outline a couple of them and then I'll spend a little bit more time on, on four particular areas and then stop to take questions. Um, on tree trimming, the, this, we know that most of the outages on the distribution system continue to be the result of trees coming into contact or falling on lines. And so in 2019, in the DTE rate case order, we ring-fenced vegetation management spending, allowing certainty of recovery for the utility, but also uh, a guarantee that those dollars would only be used for the tree trimming purposes for which they were intended, and all of this at a lower cost to customers. This was a breakthrough. Uh, as my colleague, former uh, Commissioner Norm Sari, said at the time, it's time to trim the damn trees. I think echoing something that we've all heard before as well. And it's important because without ring fencing, um, that uh, those dollars, uh, we have limited ability to control how the dollars are, are used. It's said that we set rates, not budgets that we uh, ultimately approve what the utilities can collect from their customers, but there is limited ability to make the management dis dis um, decisions about exactly where those dollars go, and the courts have found that we're not authorized to make those management decisions for utilities. So unless there is a mechanism to ensure that the money can only be used for the intended purposes, utilities have fairly broad discretion to shift uh, funds between line items as they see fit. And look, I'm not saying that that is, is always uh, arbitrary or always a bad idea. I think preserving some degree of flexibility and management discretion uh, is important. But it is uh, a frustration, particularly given the reliability challenges, when dollars that were allocated for tree trimming um, are shifted even to worthy things like storm response. It means that we're, we're still a step behind in getting out of the hole. Or when funding that's supposed to go towards capital improvements is used even for other worthwhile projects. Um, and so we've noted this a, a number of times in our orders, um, but the idea of being able to ring, front, ring fence or to track those dollars so that they can only be used for the purposes to which they're intended, improving the reliability of the system is a critically important piece of how we get to a better place. In 2021, following the, the storm orders, we, we also issued a, a storm response order uh, working to collect additional data, make that data available, uh, ground our decisions in, in what we're seeing on the system. I'd note that uh, we also held a series of two uh, technical conferences, including reviewing what other states do, how they ultimately get to better reliability results, particularly those that are similarly situated to Michigan, and then also exploring other issues, including strategic undergrounding and other reliability options. Um, we are uh, set to launch tomorrow uh, a website that will provide additional information on utility distribution system reliability, customer outages, and storm response metrics. Uh, and we're launching a second website focused on the customer, uh, providing information on how to stay safe during outage events, uh, credit information for those who are eligible, uh, and outage maps, so that really a place that, that customers can get the information that they need. 
But after the storms in 2022, um, we had had a series of storm orders going back to 2014 and indeed further back than that. And at, at some point, we knew that we needed to do something different than simply do one more storm review, come up with a series of, of additional steps that needed to be taken. And we began to ask ourselves, what don't we know that we need to know? What are the, the things that other states are doing that, uh, that a fresh set of eyes might help uncover to ultimately get to where we all want to be? And so we, for the first time, used statutory authority to launch an independent third-party audit of both the physical infrastructure of the utility distribution systems and their programs and processes. We issued the RFP for that audit last week and are currently accepted, accepting bids, accept, expect uh, to get started later this year with results next year. So I want to close with a couple of uh, specific things that we're working on uh, that we've gotten a lot of questions on over the last uh, month and a day. The first is on whether tree trimming works. And I would say emphatically, yes. It is the single best tool that we have in the toolbox to get to a better place in terms of the number of outages, but as important, the, freak, or the number of customers experiencing uh, multiple outages over the course of the year and the duration of those outages. And we've seen real progress. Consumers last year spent $90.3 million on vegetation management. That's up 154% from where they were in 2015. And the results for DTE are even more striking. They spent $162 million on vegetation management last year, uh, and that's a 179% increase over the $64.7 million in 2015. And as a result of these actions, we've seen customer interruptions uh, reduced 74% in the first year of surge funding uh, in the circuits that were trimmed, uh, and the length of the outages reduced by 67% with similar results in the consumer's territory. And just to put it in graphic form, this tracks the spending in the green line uh, from 2015 uh, between the two utilities, and then the average SADI metrics, which is the duration of outages uh, shown by the blue bars in the blue line. So the spending's gone up, the outage numbers, or the outage duration has gone down. So tree trimming does work, and we need to keep our foot on the accelerator there. We've also gotten a lot of questions on the service rules and the, the credits uh, associated with uh, violations of the service rules. So a couple of years ago now, at this point, we began to update, uh, following our 2019 statewide energy assessment, the, our service quality rules and the technical standards for electric performance. Um, <clears throat> these uh, reflect both a tightening of the acceptable levels of performance uh, that, that we expect to see, uh, both in the, the number of hours um, that we expect power to be restored within uh, following storm events, as well as the, the thresholds for customers experiencing multiple outages. We also worked on wire down relief requests, significantly tightening the, the time, in fact, cutting it in half for both metropolitan and non-metropolitan areas. This is the amount of time that police and fire are expected to guard a line before they're relieved by utility personnel. And then as has gotten a fair amount of attention, we've increased the credits uh, for those who uh, have been without power. Today, customers who meet the eligibility criteria for a credit are eligible for a one-time $25 credit, and that's it. What we've done is to increase that base credit amount to $35, to add $35 for every additional day that a customer it, remains without power once they're eligible, to index that amount to the rate of inflation, and perhaps most importantly, to make the credits automatic. Instead of having to apply and see if you're eligible, you, once you're eligible, and the utilities have this information uh, in terms of the number of hours that you've been without power, you will automatically receive that credit. These have been pending, again, for a number of years. We ran out of session days last year in the JCAR process. Um, I'm happy to say that you all have met a lot this uh, winter and spring, and so we've actually cleared uh, the number of joint session days earlier this month, and this uh, update for our service quality rules and technical standards is on the Commission's agenda for tomorrow's meeting. And then finally, I mentioned the utility audit, um, but this is really designed to identify solutions. What do we not know that we could ultimately use and leverage and apply in the Michigan context, including benchmarking other utilities across the Midwest that are similarly situated, that look in some ways similar to the situation that we have in Michigan? And so we're looking both at the physical assets of the, 
the utility infrastructure, uh, as well as the program and process, uh, whether those are sufficient for emergency preparedness, storm restoration, system maintenance, investment, and really try and uncover an additional set of solutions uh, that we can apply to ultimately get our outage numbers closer to where the people of Michigan expect and deserve. So I want to close with um, the reality that even with these efforts over the last several years, additional work is needed. One place where we see a, a real need is on, a, on increasing customer resilience. And this is looking at sort of the experience of those while we continue to work to improve our outage situation. The reality is that that's not going to happen overnight. And so how do we particularly for critical facilities, for uh, care homes, for hospitals, for vulnerable individuals who are on oxygen or need insulin that, that is maintained at a, within a specified temperature range or have CPAP machines for sleep apnea. How do we make sure that those uh, most vulnerable individuals and the most critical facilities on the system have additional resilience even as we work to rebuild the system? And we'll have a technical conference on that that we'll be announcing shortly. We need to continue the focus on accelerated vegetation management cycles. Tree trimming works, but we've got to continue to see that, that effort through and get onto a tighter cycle. Continued work on distribution planning and performance-based rate making. This is not a new thing. It was authorized for us in 2016 by the legislature. Uh, we've done a report on that. And in 2020, we directed both TD, DTE and consumers to identify a series of metrics around distribution performance, including uh, ties to their financial performance, to be filed in 2021. They did so, and after taking additional uh, input from stakeholders on their proposals, in 2022, we laid out next steps, including uh, a specific work group to consider these performance-based regulation uh, issues um, and the expectation that we would uh, launch that as sort of a capstone effort to our multi-year My Power Grid grid modernization effort. And that, uh, that effort will be uh, launched this spring as well. Um, we also need to leverage technology. The customer communications, particularly given the, the automatic metering infrastructure, the smart meters that are out on the system, clearly wasn't where it needed to be in this last system. People being told that they were reconnected when they weren't and, and that sort of thing. But that technology on the system, with, with some additional things that have been developed in the last 10 years, can ultimately help in reducing the duration of outages as well. Isolating where the real trouble is, and then through circuits and, and uh, repowering, bring most of the rest of the people back uh, who are on that circuit, because they're not actually out. It's just a couple of folks, but if we can isolate where the trouble is and then reroute the electricity to bring others back on, that can, I think, significantly reduce the duration of a number of these outages. And then continue to evaluate additional options, including strategic undergrounding, grid hardening, and the grid upgrades, particularly for our old system. There, this is in focus today because of the outage challenges and the safety challenges that we've seen. And we've seen them all too clearly, not only in this last storm, but over the last 10 years. But we also know that the grid's changing and that we're expecting more of our distribution grid than we ever have before as we electrify transportation and potentially other end uses. And I will tell you that the commission is focused both on getting to a better place in terms of the reliability that people expect and deserve, as well as making sure that our grid is ready to handle the challenges that are being asked of it. And with that, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Scripps. Um, we'll come back to the audit for a moment. Um, just the timeline on that, um, you, the, the RFP hasn't even been met yet. Is that my understanding? It's been issued. It went out last Monday. Um, there's a, a several weeks where we're accepting bids, uh, and then they'll have to be evaluated with, with work starting later this year. So, uh, but it was ordered, or your determination to start that audit process was, did you say October? Of, October of last year. And so we're in March, and then when will that actually get back to us? I think it will, well, the audit closes uh, next month, and then, or the RFP process, sorry, closes next month, and then we hope to, to start as soon as we can after that. It's ultimately a, a process because it's uh, above a certain dollar threshold, or we expect it will be, um, that it's not just a, a MPSC thing or even a, D, or a, a LARA thing, the agency with, in which we're housed, or the department, uh, but ultimately a DTMB uh, piece that involves the administrative board. So um, I'll tell you that we're working to, to shorten that, but I will also say um, that this is the first time that we've ever done it. So once we decided to use the statutory authority that, that we have been granted, but that we haven't used, um, we needed to essentially start from, we didn't have 
uh, something that we could simply plug and play. So uh, understanding what the process would be, understanding what we wanted to cover in the audit, the questions to be asked. Um, we want this to be a comprehensive effort, but, but it has taken longer than, than I would have liked. Senator Baer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> and thank you for coming back to see Absolutely. us again. Um, you're so knowledgeable. Uh, it's it's uh, nice to be able to talk with you. So, but one of the things I heard you talking about was the spending on tree trimming, because obviously that does have an impact. Um, so I was just thinking about the last year, $163 million in, in tree trimming is, is seems like a big number. Um, DTE had $1.1 $1 .1 billion in profits. So that's seven times what they spent on trying to build reliability into the system. So when you talk about flexibility in defining how to direct their funding, is there a way we can redirect, whether with you or with laws, to make sure that their profitability isn't so grotesque, that the reliability money is so minuscule as to almost not be noticed in comparison? I, I think one of the, the goals of the um, performance-based Raymaking regulation, the effort that we've been working on for the last couple of years is is to better align the the utility financial performance with the results that that their customers are seeing from from the system. And we've been, I think, fairly successful at that in some other places on energy efficiency spending, for example. That we found something that's made us best in class in in Michigan. Uh, that, but where they also have uh, financial upside for not only meeting statutory standards but exceeding them. And um, so I think there are models that we can use and, and be thoughtful about how we implement. But I think um, where we've seen the most dramatic improvements in other places is where we can ultimately get everybody pointed in the same direction, that how the utility does best financially is how their customers do best uh, from a reliability standpoint. And I think that's, that's the goal that we're looking at. Yeah, well, but we have seen reports, and I know you're doing a new one, which is great. I um, mean, our utility, our, our monopoly DTE has um, got the lowest scores in reliability and the highest scores in cost to customer around the country. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to be that adamant. No. <laughs> um, but lowest cost, of, you know, lowest ratings for performance, highest cost to customers, and we still haven't been able to do anything about their spending on making it more reliable. Do you need to change something or do we need to change the laws to make this happen? There's probably room for both. Um, I, think the, we, I think we have the authority that we need around performance-based um, regulation, um, but if there were sort of specific standards that you wanted to direct us to, to adhere to or to implement, I, th I think we could do that. Um, we have clear statutory authority on resource planning on the generation side, but the reality is that we actually spend more on the distribution side, and all of the outages are on the distribution side at this point. And so looking at how we do distribution planning and whether the five-year plans that currently need to be filed but aren't sort of formally reviewed or approved or, or anything else could become the basis for, for those investments um, might be something else to look at. Thank you. Senator Bellino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, th thank you for coming to see us, Dan. Number two, inadequate tree vegetation. I want me, I, do I have 30 seconds to tell a story about my city, sir? 25. 20 seconds. <laughs> they did a study on our, uh, our silver maples that were planted in the early 19th century in Monroe. We used to be known as the floral city. They're beautiful trees until they get 110 to 120 years old and they fall like sticks all the time. And that's the biggest problem in my area. Uh, I've been out of power a lot the last 25 years in my home, all caused by a tree behind my neighbor's house in a, in a yard, in a lot, mm -hmm. that the owner did not want to take down. And DT couldn't go down and trim it because they weren't allowed to. So if we want to do tree re vegetation, and you mentioned it, Mr. Chair, maybe we should create a law that says if this vegetation is going to hurt the people around you because it may fall and put power out, that DT or consumers has the ability to trim it up. That's one of the problems. People went nuts in my city when the city wanted to start taking some of these old ma uh, the silver maples down and plant new trees, and they stopped it. So now we still have the 120-year-old trees in the streets by the lines, and ironically, two days after the article was in the paper, Mr. Chair, a silver maple came down that wasn't marked to come down. It was supposed to be a healthy silver maple, and totaled my nephew's car. But he did get a new car out of it, which was nice. 
So if we need to trim the, the vegetation, then we need to have the authority yep. to go in and trim the vegetation. Because right now we're just doing a mouthpiece thing. We need to trim it, but we can't because they won't let us. Yeah, there's, there was a, so two really quick responses. There was a story in the Lansing State Journal yesterday on the experience that Lansing Board of Water and Light had. And if you remember back to 2013, the ice storm that happened, and it happened for everybody, but it was particularly bad here. Um, and they adopted a strategy that they were going to be very aggressive in trimming trees. They haven't made a lot of friends as a result, but their outage numbers are much better. And so there is a challenge, people want to keep their trees, but they want the reliability, but there's a, a right tree, right place philosophy here that um, trees are beautiful, but they can't interfere with the, the grid reliability. And I think that's part of what we've got to look at. The other piece, um, to your point, that there is a lot of frustration. We've done three town halls this week, eight hours of testimony, 114 comments, and a lot of them were focused on the frustration of the service drop between the pole and the, the home um, being the, the responsibility of the, the homeowner, which is true. A lot of people don't understand that, but it is true. And so I think, but that's also a place where there are a lot of outages and where there are a lot of single outages, where it's not going out and doing some work can bring a thousand people on or a hundred people on. It's several hours of people work to bring one person back on. And so that may be a place where we need to, to take a look at either authority, undergrounding, whatever it needs to be. But in terms of that service drop between the pole and the home, because the after the storm hits, when the wire's pulled down, then the utility does have to go out and do some of the restoration work. Not actually the electrical to connect it back to the house, but the, the trimming and restoration to, to get that in a position where it can be hooked back up. So we're still spending the time. It's just we're doing it after the fact when it's more expensive, more dangerous, and more difficult. Thanks. Senator Hertel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dan, for being here today, and thank you for all the town halls you've done this week, uh, allowing the public to come in and share their stories uh, about how they were impacted during this most recent outage, but also over recent years. Uh, you know, I was living part-time here in Lansing in 2013 when that ice storm hit here, uh, and uh, a family home was uh, severely damaged with burst pipes because of how long that outage lasted, and obviously those temp the temperatures then were, I think, below 10 degrees. Uh, during that outage. Uh, and then now in the community that I live in, uh, and most of my district was hit very hard by this past ice storm and the wind storm last summer. Uh, you know, in looking at what some other states have done and in investing in their grids, and uh, there's no doubt that certain areas of our state and my community, uh, which is an older community, uh, they, the grid is just outdated, right? The infrastructure is old and it needs to be updated. Um, and in doing that, and when we look at as you said, strategic undergrounding to make sure we get some of those wires that are being impacted today underground and protect them better, but uh, tree trimming. But grid automation seems to be the place where I think we have the best opportunity to try to isolate those outages, um, affect less people, and re make repairs much quicker. Uh, there was an outage in my area this past storm that, frankly, I, I mean, this is all anecdotal, but there were employees of the utility walking around looking for the outage for hours, trying to figure out where it was. Uh, and that was one of the, lo the longest outages in my community uh, in the Gro Gross Point area. How do we balance, as, uh, my understanding is a very small portion of the grid is automated today. Uh, and it's a large investment to get us to the point where we probably need to be. Uh, how do we manage or balance those large investments that need to be made with rate increases that are impacting people across all of our communities today. Welcome to the world of the Public Service Commission. I, <laughs> so, I, it, it, you're absolutely right. And I mean, we've seen other utilities, the utility that serves Chicago, for example, has automated a significantly larger amount of their system. They get similar storms to some degree. I mean, our weather's the sim similar. But they can, through sort of sensors and reclosers, isolate the damage on the system and get most of the rest of the folks uh, restored sometimes without even sort of sending a crew out and so um, but that takes money the 4.8 kilovolt system that's in your uh, district in large parts of Detroit the oldest part of the system and the most dangerous part of the system clearly needs to be upgraded and we've taken some steps to sort of provide certainty as you're going down this path to to make sure that that you're doing it and and um, 
and, and making the investments with, with certainty of recovery. But that's really expensive. And then tree trimming, yeah, I think, is reasonably affordable. But, but those, you know, those numbers are hundreds of millions of dollars as well. And so it is that balance of, of trying to sort of, and I think it's the reason that the sort of consideration of alternatives and the distribution planning process, looking at sort of not what you could do or the laundry list of ideas, but how do you optimize those in the most cost-effective manner, getting the most uh, additional uh, reliability and resilience for the dollars that are being invested in the system. I'm not going to tell you that it's easy or that there's a straightforward answer, but that's, that is essentially what we do both in the individual investment uh, evaluations contained in rate cases and in the, in the five-year distribution plans that, again, we ask for, we don't have authority to approve or anything else, but that gives us greater transparency on how the individual investments sought in a particular rate case tie into a broader, at least five-year strategy. But, but that's the exact right question. So again, I, with apologies, I know we have a couple other questions in the queue, but I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Scripps, for coming before us today. And I know that uh, it probably won't be the last time, and um, uh, also certainly members can avail themselves to you any time as, as well. So thank yeah, you very absolutely. much. Absolutely. And if I didn't get to your question, Senator Schink, um, I, please give me a call. I'm happy to, to talk. I need to leave. I've got to talk to MISO about the other side of reliability, um, but Rika and Mike are going to stay. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, we have uh, Trevor Lauer, uh, President of DTE Electric. Um, thank you for being here today, Mr. Lauer. And as we've said, we have, you know, constrained time. And so um, please proceed. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Trevor Lauer, and DTE Electric Company at DTE. Appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning and talk about the weather events. We submit written testimony. I will keep my verbal testimony to a minimum so we can go into the Q and A portion of this. Uh, a couple things that I would start with first: uh, the deepest apology for myself and all 10,000 employees of DTE to our customers at Lost Power and our communities. By no means is this. Is, is your mic on, sir, Mr. Lauer? I'm sorry. Let's check that. No. So I'm really sorry about that. Thank Did you. Did you guys hear me, or would you like me to start over? I think you said a couple of very salient things I'd like to have you probably just repeat. So. Uh, okay. Well, I, I'll start over just first by apologizing to the customers and the communities for the outages that we had. Um, neither myself nor any of the employees at, at DTE would wish any of our customers have an outage. This is not the, the service that we want for our customers. I can talk about ice storms. I can talk about hurricane force winds. At the end of the day, the climate has changed. We need to change our grid with it. That's our responsibility. We recognize that and we fully accept the responsibility we have. Um, I would like to thank you, Chairman, for your recognition of the employees uh, during the time. We ask our employees to work for 16 hours and then eight hours off. We had multiple employees, thousands of employees that worked for 14 straight days. Uh, I will tell you that I started most of my mornings at 6 a.m. out in what we call our pullout areas where you'll have hundreds of bucket trucks. The level of resiliency that I saw in our employees to continue to do the work on behalf of our customers was nothing short of amazing to me. Public safety and employee safety is also extremely important. We were able to get through all of this without any injuries to our employees or any injuries to the public. And I appreciate what the chairman said, uh, operating a high voltage electric system can be very dangerous for the public and for our employees. So I was very proud that we were able to get through the, the issues. Um, all that said, uh, what do we do going forward? So I, I think that there's really two things that I would highlight so we can get to the questions. First, we have developed a distribution grid plan, and the chairman talked about that. Our distribution grid plan, I would say, high level does two things. It lays out a five-year spending pattern for the electric utility on what are we going to invest in. It lays out the categories, and it lays out the metrics on why we're going to do that. It also lays out scenario planning for a 15-year period on what we think could happen. So there's three scenarios that I would highlight. One in our plan that we submitted in 2021 talks about continued severe weather. What are the investments you need to make in the utility grid 
for in continued severe weather. The second one is a high electrification scenario. And the third is a deep distributed generation scenario. So we've laid out the work that we believe needs to happen across it. In our distribution grid plan, we are very clear that we need to continue to accelerate investment. There's four main things that we call out in our distribution grid plan that I think are really critical, and the chairman touched on a couple of them. One is tree trimming. Over 70% of our outages, not only the frequency, so the number of time customers lose power, but the duration is caused by trees. Not only trees inside of our right-of-way, but many trees falling outside of our right-of-ways on top of the utility service. I cannot trim every tree inside of the state of Michigan. Calendar year 21, we spent $160 million on tree trim. Calendar year 22, we spent $240 million on tree trim. I requested permission from the Public Service Commission in 2019 to go from a 10-year tree trim cycle, meaning every 10 years we trim the circuit, to a five-year tree trim cycle. That is best in class in the U.S. By 2014, I will be on a five-year tree trim cycle for all of our circuits across our system. That will fundamentally and is fundamentally making a difference. The second is great maintenance. You have to maintain an electrical system. On our electrical system, we do over 50,000 maintenance activities on an annual basis. Calendar year 21 to calendar year 22 and pull top maintenance, which is one of the main ones, we've increased our spending from $30 million to $82 million on pull top maintenance. We need to continue to invest in great maintenance. That is one of the fundamentals. The third piece we do and we highlight in our distribution grid plan is the age of the system and rebuilding it and strategic undergrounding. I appreciate the comment that you made. Detroit was one of the first electrified cities, not only in the U.S., but in the world. Some of our electrical infrastructure we operate is from the early 1900s. It needs to be replaced. There's no more upgrading it. There's no more hardening it. At some point, you have to take on some of these major projects to start to replace it. I use the analogy, unlike roads, I can't shut our system down while I rebuild it. I have to rebuild it while everything's hot so that customers continue to be served in our system. Strategic undergrounding is an important piece of it. The chairman talked about the service drops that comes from the home to the, or from the pole to the home. In 2016, we requested from the Public Service Commission to no longer allow overhead service drops. 50% of all of the issues we have in our system are in people's backyards. I'm not blaming our customers. But we have an issue with 1.8 million wires that hang in from the pole to people's back, backyards. All of that goes underground now. We need to continue to tackle this issue. The last two days of the ice storm, we spent restoring 15,000 customer services that were in their backyards. Um, our customers do not trim these services. We know they do not trim these services. We do not trim the services. So when they were put in, no trees existed. It continues to be an issue. So rebuilding the system and using strategic undergrounding has to be a piece of it. Lastly, I would say is automation. We talked a lot about automation. We have been on a five-year journey to automate our system. In order to put automation devices in the field, you have to have the right software in the system to control it. All of that was completed last year at DTE. Our goal is to put 10,000 automated devices in the field in the next five years. That will fundamentally change the duration of outages for our customers. When you look at DTE, there's two ways you think about reliability. One is the frequency of the number of outages you have. We're in the top 50%, meaning 50% of the utilities are worse than us. We need to get better. That's through tree trimming and, and maintenance of the system. Where we really struggle is the lack of automation on our system. We will make a fundamental change in automation now that we have the backbone to do the automation. And a simple analogy I use is old Christmas lights versus new Christmas lights. Old Christmas lights, when you lost a bulb, everything went out. Automation, you lose a bulb, everything stays hot. We continue to serve all the customers. That ability exists in 90% of the utilities across the United States today. It's not, it's not something new. We know, how to in, we know how to do that inside of the, the utility here. We need to continue to invest in that. The last thing I'll mention, Chair, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you, is um, accountability. Um, we have requested twice an investment or an infrastructure recovery mechanism that ring fence spend on our electric utility system. Over half the, the states and half the utilities in the country have that today. We recognize the concern, 
I am perfectly happy with ring fencing our capital investments. We want to invest it just like everybody else does. Ultimately, the goal is to get to a great grid. I'll finish again with apologizing to our customers and communities, not the service that we would ever want to offer. Uh, and I make no excuses. We are responsible. I am responsible for increasing the resiliency of the grid. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lauer. We do have some questions. Um, start with uh, Senator Chang. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your presentation um, and the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Uh, I recently saw a map of DTE's hardening of its infrastructure across the city of Detroit um, it, that indicated to me that the lowest priority areas in terms of when they will uh, take place for hardening are the areas with the highest poverty rates and the highest levels of unemployment and the areas focused on for modernization of infrastructure tend to be neighborhoods either in downtown or closer to downtown. Uh, uh, rather than areas further away with higher rates of poverty. Uh, so I was wondering if you could speak to how DTE prioritizes what neighborhoods to focus on and how is equity either considered or not considered in making that kind of determination about where to prioritize. Thank you, Senator Chang, for the uh, very direct question. Um, five years ago, we started to put a very focused effort on where we invest in the most vulnerable communities. As the My EJ tool came out, we have backcast all of those investments against the tool. Uh, 483 census tracts, which are 29% of the census tracts we serve, uh, show up as 80% um, or more in the My EJ, in the My EJ screening tool. 80% uh, of our hardening is happening in those 483 census tracts. So it makes up 29% of our overall system, but 80% of our hardening is actually happening in that. We didn't have the tool up front, but I appreciate the tool to be able to backcast it. We've had a very clear focus on our most vulnerable communities, and we will continue to have it. It is not currently part of our um, planning process, um, but we do use vulnerable communities as part of our planning process for investments. I guess just a quick follow-up on that and then another question. Um, so I'm hearing that you're prioritizing more now than you previously did now that the tool is available. Um, I guess I'm wondering, are you able to shift or are, is there information that you can publicly share around how you are shifting the time frame of some of the communities that believe that they are sort of a couple of years later? Are you shifting any of that now using the EJ screening tool? And then if I could, just the, the other question that I had was, uh, there was a recent Bridge Michigan article uh, highlighting that DTE paid out $700 million to investors in 2022, uh, but then paused hiring and maintenance in order to hit revenue targets. And that article pointed out that job openings went unfilled, contractors were eliminated, and overtime was limited, and maintenance work was postponed. And then, as we know, in February, more than 450,000 DTE customers lost power. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to how DTE prioritizes payouts uh, to investors versus making improvements to the grid or keeping residential rates more affordable. Yeah, thank you, Senator Chang. So two questions there I wanna, I wanna unpack both of them. So first, um, we haven't done anything different with the screening tool. Uh, we made those adjustments well before the screening tool came out. So 80% of our hardening work today goes to the communities that have been identified by the My EJ screening tool, and that was done well before the tool ever existed. So I'm pleased to say that as we backcast and look at that, that we were making the right investments in the right community, but we commit to continue to use the tool because it's the right thing to do. Uh, in, re in regards to our stakeholders in the Bridge article, while I did not read the article, we talk about four stakeholders at DTE. We start with our employees because we think our employee base is the most important employee, uh, the most important stakeholder we have. And what DTE has done is we've made a compact with our employees that unlike many com companies, not only here in Michigan, but across the country, we're not going to lay our employees off when we run into difficulties. Uh, the second is our customers. If we do the right thing for our employees, we fundamentally believe that our employees will do the right thing for our customers. All of our employees live in our communities. Our communities are our third most important stakeholder that we talk about. And fourth are our investors, and they do have an important role. So the Bridge article, I understand, highlighted a investor slide that our CFO used with investors. And it talked about deferring some maintenance. I want to address it very clearly. 
From 21 to 22, we increased maintenance on our distribution system by over $120 million. I have asked our team to pause a handful of maintenance activities going into 2023. None of those have happened yet. I'll give you two great examples of what they are. Number one, a maintenance activity we do at our substations is how often we mow our substations. I've asked our team to go from two every two weeks to every six weeks in our substations. The third is all, or the second activity that I would highlight is we hire summer students to um, inspect underground transformer pad mounts. They're concrete bases. We have 50,000 of these. We look at 20% of them every year. We did not hire summer students this year. Neither of these activities cause any concern for me. We will not pause any maintenance activity that causes a safety issue for our employees or our public or will cause reliability issues. We could not have been more clear with that, and I believe our CFO said that uh, in the actual, in the actual uh, statement when he went through it. So I hope I answered your question, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Schink. Thank you for coming today. And of course, I want to thank all the DTE employees that were out working on the outage. My family was out of power for, for four days. Um, we've talked about the, the profits, about a billion dollars in profits were posted during the, the ice storm outage. Your CEO makes over $10 million a year. You recently put in a request to the MPC SC for the largest rate increase in state history, about 622 million. DTE has increased rates four times in the last five years, totaling over 800 million in increases. And we're still, we have regular outages. I would argue that there's not really any increase in um, reliability from those, from, from those rate increases. You regularly have a return on equity, which is about 10%. Um, would you be willing to reduce that rate of return to invest in more reliability? And before you answer, I just want to say um, many companies want to offer a high rate of return to their investors. When their products suffer, typically the rate of return suffers, and I don't see that happening here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator. I will, uh... I'm going to try to answer all the questions, so please tell me if I don't. Um, I'll start with the rate of return. The rate of return is set by the Michigan Public Service Commission, not by the utilities. The rate of return is designed to reflect the riskiness of a utility. Utilities that have an infrastructure recovery mechanisms and other uh, tracking mechanisms tend to have lower rates of returns across the country because they're seen as less risky to attract capital. Our dividend payout, which you reflected, or somebody asked a question earlier on, uh, is 3.5%, which is in the middle of all the utilities in the United States. Again, it's very low relative to other companies that pay a dividend because we're seen as a less risky investment. Other than government bonds, most people will invest in utilities. Two-thirds of the profitability of a company like DTE or most utilities goes back to the investors because we borrow money every year to run our operations. Uh, the other third of our profitability goes directly back into operating our system, into uh, bettering our system through what you call retained earnings. So two-thirds to the, to the shareholders and a third goes back, back into the customers. Um, the second piece, or the, the other question that you ask is around uh, reliability. Uh, I can only tell you where we make the investments, the investments continue to work. Uh, we have continued to invest in tree trimming, pull top maintenance, and other maintenance practices. When you have a large electric utility system, the first thing you need to do is stabilize it. So as we see the weather coming, we are stabilizing the system. Utilities that we've benchmarked with in Florida and the Gulf Coast have been seeing this weather and they've been stabilizing and investing in their system for over two decades. We are in the first six years of starting to invest in our system. I want to make no mistake that the investment needs to continue. Uh, that is how you get great operating. We can make strategic investments like automation, which will fundamentally change the duration of an outage. And I think that's something that you should hold us accountable for doing as quickly as, pos as we possibly can. Thank you. Senator DeMoose. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking the time to testify today. And I, I really appreciate you taking responsibility for this. And I'm sure there are things we can do better, but let's not forget that three quarters of an inch of ice would be devastating anywhere. So you've laid out um, some great plans. I mean, this fi switching to five-year tree trimming, switching to undergrounding, these type of things. It sounds like you know things that we can do to improve the system. My question is, what can we do at the state level to help make this a reality, and what types of things would you say we should avoid that would just get in the way of such progress? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I, I, uh, I've never sat where you guys sit, but I'll, try, I'll do my best to answer the question. So the first thing I'd say for the, the state is uh, increased energy assistance for our customers. Specifically with DTE last year, we had a record amount of money that came into our, our system for energy assistance. It is never enough to help our customers that struggle, not only with electric bills, but gas bills, water bills, and everything else that's going on. So I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. Uh, second, I think the most important thing that this body can do is make sure that the investments that need to be made get made. Right? And there's ways to do that through infrastructure recovery mechanisms, performance-based rates, or another area where we see um, states around the country start to lean into this. And third, and while it may seem somewhat odd, I think you need to hold the utilities accountable where they make those investments. When we make these investments, they show positive results, and you should expect us and our people to show these positive results. Last, I'd say workforce. We can do all of this, but the most important thing or the most important resource we have is our labor partners to actually be able to do the work. We've tripled the number of tree trimmers in the last six years on the DTE system, and we've doubled the number of linemen, line people working on the, on the DTE system. We still have a fraction. It is a fight between every utility in the country to try to get resources to do this work. Helping us with workforce planning, we have a partnership with the Department of Correction at Parnell Correction Institute where we help returning citizens. And we also have started one with the city of Detroit with our Detroit Tree Trim Academy for graduates. These are great jobs that we need to build workforce. Where do I think we should not go? Um, it's probably not fair to me to say, but um, at the end of the day, the way to fix this is through your utilities. We have a grid. We have to work collaboratively together on what the solutions are. And those solutions require us to be strategic in, investment, in investing and continuing to invest. I understand the frustration that customers have. and I do not blame them for being frustrated. I apologize, Senator, for you being out of power for four days. That is unacceptable for you to be out. But the most important thing we can do now is continue the investment into the grid. That's how it gets better. The only way it gets better is continuing the investment in the grid. We've seen this across state by state. We're not the only state that's had an ice storm. I can give you statistics. I am so proud of the way our people responded. We responded faster than any other state you'll see with this ice storm. This is not, these occurrences are happening all over the United States right now. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Senator Polhanke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lauer. Um, somebody from DTE during the last ice storm called me, and, and so I put him to work. And it wasn't till, you know, we had, I, I had sent him off on a few jobs that I, I realized that it was your CEO, Jerry. And uh, so once I found that out, I continued to put him to work. Um, he did a good job. We probably texted 50 or 100 times between texts and phone calls. But I kept thinking about what about the people who don't have the CEO on the other line? And, you know, he helped me with my district. I want to give credit for that. But I'm going to tell you what I told him. The $25 to $35 credit is a joke. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for me to tell my constituents that that's all they're going to get for all the rotten food, you know, all the, the heartache. Um, I don't think there's any reason that you as a company can't voluntarily up that rate, even though it's set by the, the Public Service Commission. And I, and I would definitely urge you to do that. I do know that working with United Way, you were able to give greater reimbursements to extremely low income people. I appreciate that. But um, <clears throat> a lot of people suffered. So um, in addition to 
um, automating the grid, ramping up the tree trimming even further. Uh, I wanna talk about strategic undergrounding. Much of my district is old neighborhoods. I didn't get calls from Canton because Canton is a lot of new neighborhoods. I know that six, since the late 1960s, electric wires and subdivisions must be buried by law. Um, not the situation in Livonia, Garden City, Inkster, Westland. I, I've heard it costs six million dollars per mile to bury, you know, is that correct? First of all, and that seems to be the gold standard. So for people in my district who have the wires that aren't going anywhere, in addition to automating tree trimming, how can we lower the cost of strategic, strategic undergrounding so that some people in my district in the old neighborhoods can have relief? Yeah, th thank you, Senator. Um, strategic undergrounding is a, a really important piece and the $6 million a mile uh, I will say is probably not correct. Depending on the conditions you operate, if you're undergrounding in a, in a very rural area where there's not a lot of other um, infrastructure that's in the road, uh, we see that being done for less than a million dollars a mile. We've done some of this in the city of Detroit. We have two different pilots in the city of Detroit going on right now with strategic undergrounding, and it's approaching four and a half million dollars a mile. How do you get the cost down? You start to do it at scale. Um, there's utilities that are doing strategic undergrounding across the United States at scale. Um, scale, um, I think you guys know what I'm, I mean, but do a lot of it all at once. Crews get really good at it. Uh, your your uh, supply chain process gets, gets ironed out. Uh, so that's not a once every two years, but it is a once every month activity that you're undertaking. We see this across the US where costs will come down by 50%. Once you get repetitive crews that are doing it, because you have to learn how to do it, and the conditions will be slightly different in each area that you do it. There's really interesting pilots that are happening around the United States. I'll mention Florida quickly, where they're partnering with communities that would like to underground their entire overhead system, and they've received permission for the utilities to give up to a 30% credit back to those communities, because it's not only our wires, but they need to take all the telecommunication wires, the cable wires, and everything else. Uh, that needs to be undergrounded and the communities actually undertake that work themselves and the utilities just oversee the uh, The safety of the work with their wires going underneath, but it's done by a different contractor than even the, the utility So I, I think there's a real benefit for us to do this might I suggest piloting in Senate District 5. Thank you Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I'm Minority Vice Chair Lowers Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just I thought, uh, you know, we, we've, it seems like we're talking around a subject of profitability here a little bit, and I, I want to ask, you know, there's, you've mentioned a couple of things, uh, Mr. Lauer, and, you know, uh, when you talk about infrastructure recovery or incentive in sort of recovery, can you explain a little more? I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I, it stands to reason that, that lower profits means less investment, so I don't know if, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that, we're not sending a message that, that we think DT should have lower mandatory lower profits or something like that. And so I have a number of questions, just but really want to focus on explaining a little bit more what, what you mean when you say recovery. Um, and uh, I think you've I think you've addressed a lot of the other areas. If you're at 3.5 percent, you're in the ballpark. Then you're in the ballpark of of you know because you have to compete for your investment the same as anyone else i would imagine and and uh what we what we're all asking for i think here what we're all driving is more investment in our in our utility um, infrastructure and not less so can you uh tell me more about what you're really saying when you talk about the is it a different recovery system than you have today or yes yeah, so I mean, thank you senator the uh, i apologize i interrupted you um with the uh Infrastructure recovery mechanism, the chair of the Public Service Commission was talking about ring fencing spend. So the, essentially the way it happens is we would come forward and say, I want to spend $100 on undergrounding something. 
right? And what it does is the dollars can only be used for that project. And if they're not used for that project, the dollars go back to the customers. So the way that many states have taken it, because they want to make sure that they're directing dollars into the infrastructure, and very particular infrastructure, it could be undergrounding, it could be tree trimming, you ring fence these dollars so that the utility does not have the opportunity to move those to other projects. I appreciate the chairman. There's many projects that come up that are critical um, critical issues that show up on an electrical system that you also need to address, we can do that also. So when I think about the infrastructure recovery, it's this concept of how do you ring fence to make sure that the most important things are being done on the electric utility, and everybody has confidence that the utility is making those investments, and if we don't make those investments, the dollars go back to the customers. The other thing it requires us is to give a whole battery of reporting around each of those investments. So when we talk about performance, it gives the accountability so you can come back and say, we made those investments, did they or did they not perform the way we expected in, it could be a district, it could be a town, it could be a whatever area you define. Um, we're very comfortable taking that process because I know when we make the investments, they do work. Um, I hope I'm answering the question, Senator. Thank you, and apologies to members in the queue. We just have time for one more before we go to the next presenter, which is Senator Camilleri. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, so I'm looking at this graph from the MPSC, and it's out, you know, detailing all of the major storms, the 250,000 outages plus from 2013 until today. The thing that I'm really struggling with, and I think our residents are struggling with too, is understanding what has changed. So we are in a position where we just keep having storms continue to happen. We keep having you guys come talk about what happened and what we're going to do to change the system. And it doesn't feel like things are changing. Yes, we've seen increases in money for tree trimming, but it's not working. Uh, so where, when can we get to a place where we feel confidence in the changes that are coming and seeing the improvements in our communities? I wanna just highlight some of my own district. Uh, Wayne, City of Wayne, as well as City of Trenton, our older communities, post-World War II suburbs that have aging infrastructure. We understand that. They were the hardest hit, and they continue to be the hardest hit. In every one of these storms, we had massive outages during that time. But then, similar to Center Polhanke, like in Brownstown Township, it's a newer post-2000s uh, community, very few power outages. And so we see the clear differences. We know the answer is undergrounding. Why don't we ever hear that as a priority for... Uh, investment going forward. Right, so um, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, I want to address the first piece. Um, so we have been working aggressively on the frequency of outages, and we've been able to maintain the same frequency of outages, which is in the second quartile uh, of utilities across the U.S. Again, not where we want to be. We need to continue to improve that. Uh, where we have not been able to make an, or gain traction is on the duration of outages. That is what separates DTE from the other utilities that we speak about. Whether it's ComEd or PICO in Philadelphia, they have very similar number of outages that we have, but the duration of bringing those customers back. This is why I'm stressing automation so much. We've laid the groundwork for five years to put ourselves in a position to massively start to automate our system. Now you should hold us accountable to execute back against that investment, assuming that we're allowed to make that investment on our electric system. It is critically important. That's how customers will fundamentally see a difference. Your second question is undergrounding. I will tell you that we've brought multiple strategic undergrounding pilots forward. The job of DTE is to work with our regulators and all the other stakeholders that participate in our regulatory process so that we can receive permission to start to move forward with some of those undergrounding pilots that we'd like to do. So far, we haven't been successful on many of those, trying to get everybody to agree with us that it's important, but I will tell you it is important, uh, and we need to continue to look at where we can strategically underground pieces of our system. Quick follow-up. Who's, who's getting in the way? Uh, I wouldn't say that anybody's getting in the way, Senator. I would say uh, it's on DTE to make a better, a better argument with everybody so that they understand why it's important. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senators, and um, th thank you very much, Mr. Lauer. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today. Um, next, we have from Consumers Energy, uh, Ms. Tanya Berry and uh, Chris Laird. If you please uh, join us and um, again, you know, appreciate your cognizance of the time and appreciate that uh, we have probably some continued questions from members. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, and thank you, Chair McCann and committee members for allowing us to testify before you today. I'm Tanya Berry. I'm the Senior Vice President of Transformation and Engineering at Consumers Energy. I am responsible for our gas and electric engineering group, our quality, and our renewable energy uh, group. I am super excited about our transition to renewable energy and coming off of coal, and it's exciting to be able to lead in that way. But while we're transforming, what I think about is our 6.7 million gas and electric customers here in the state of Michigan. <coughs> Anyone who knows me knows that I work and lead for all people. And I think about that every single day and every decision that I make. I, was, I lead with joy in a way that motivates my coworkers to, when they're out there grinding it out in extreme weather conditions for 16 hours a day, 10 days, across multiple storm waves, restoring powers to our customers. I empathize deeply with our customers who experience prolonged outages as a result of the ice storm that swept through Michigan. I, along with everyone, from our call center coworkers to our CEO, responded and talked to customers with the sole intent to better understand the experience customers faced and provide transparent updates on our restoration progress. The team I work with every single day, they put the needs of the customers before their own. We often see the line workers out there restoring power, and they are amazing, and thank you for recognizing that. But I want you to know there are thousands of additional coworkers behind the scenes working to support our line men and women and reduce the restoration time for our customers. At Consumers Energy, we can't control the weather, but we can control our response. Our vision is to perform at a world-class level while delivering hometown service for our customers. Whether that is a line worker on a pole, a dispatcher that's sending the next job to the crew, an employee guarding a down power line, or a forestry worker that's clearing the way for that line worker to access that pole. We show up for our customers in all weather conditions, cold, wind, and rain. Customers know we'll be there after a storm sweeps through their community. However, what they might not know is we did file an electric distribution plan in 2021 with the Michigan Public Service Commission, which included major investments in our distribution grid to improve reliability for all customers. Last year, we completed over 2,000 electric infrastructure projects, cleared over 7,000 miles of power lines, replaced 10,000 poles, upgraded 100 substations, and continued to incorporate smart technologies to improve grid operations through our electric distribution plan. This plan is a five-year strategy where we define the condition of our system, we determine the investments needed, we determine where it's needed most, and how do we make dramatic reliability improvements that our customers deserve. Here are the facts in 2022. We invested above and beyond, above and beyond the amounts that were included in our rates for forestry and reliability programs. That was an additional $35 million in spend to improve our system. These are investments we were required to make. These are investments we knew we needed to make to make our system better. And we're already starting to see the results. In 2022, we saw 20% fewer customer outages after we made those upgrades and completed those 2,000 projects. We also reduced in half the total number of minutes customers were without power compared to the previous year and restored more than 96% of our customers in outages in less than 24 hours, demonstrating continued investments in the grid with efforts to make it more reliable are paying off. Despite those investments, there are times in which extreme weather, ice, freezing rain, and wind can create substantial outages on our system, like what happened last month. I know how frustrating it can be to be without power. This is just the beginning, and I know our customers deserve better. As we learn from this storm and future events, we will continue to work with all stakeholders to make the needed investments across the grid to ensure we are clean, reliable, and affordable for all our customers. This is our commitment. I would like to turn it over to Chris Lair, our Vice President of Electric Operations, who can speak to the company's restoration that we experienced and the challenges we had during the restoration process. 
Thank you, Mr. Berry. Again, Mr. Laird, we're starting to run up against tight timelines. We have yeah, I'll be very brief. I'll give you guys a copy of the testimony afterward. That's okay. So good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm the Vice President of Electric Ops for Consumers. I'm responsible for operations, maintenance, and restoration activities. Been in this role since September, about 25 years here at the company. Prior to that, worked for a municipality and was a former volunteer firefighter. Um, I have performed every role in restoration that our company has, whether that be sitting on a wire guard, whether that be responding as a volunteer firefighter and sitting on a wire down, whether that be running our dispatch center or performing line work. I've done all those things throughout the course of my career. Um, I'm really proud of our folks and I wanna just um, share my appreciation as well for our line workers, our dispatchers, our folks that responded. Um, monumental storm for us, second biggest in company history for us. Uh, a lot of challenge that we saw throughout the course of it. We had nine counties that were hardest hit. I talked to all the emergency managers in all nine counties personally. I met with the sheriff in Kalamazoo County. I had the emergency management team come on site to our mobile command center there, Greenville, Big Rapids, Jackson, and Hillsdale. So I just want you to know I was personally out 20 hours a day communicating and making sure that those members had a direct line of contact for any emergencies, any support they needed from us as we move forward throughout it. The other thing that I wanna share is just a couple of challenges we had. So outage map is the first one. Um, we have a new system that we're using in our dispatch centers. We found a defect during the middle of the storm that was inaccurately reporting outages. Some people were getting notified their outage was gonna be six days, seven, eight days out, which was inaccurate. Other folks were being notified they were actually back on when they weren't. Throughout the course of the storm, we tried to repair that defect as it happened. We could not do it without taking the system down. We had to wait until the storm was over on March 8th. We made that fixed, it is fixed going forward. The other piece that's sort of tied with that is our estimated time of restoration. So that's customers depend on that text message, that phone call, that email to say, I'm gonna be on at this date and this time. We had a similar defect that was causing challenges there. That was fixed as well on March 8th. I want to acknowledge that that's or, uh, inexcusable, that that can't happen for our customers. They depend on us to communicate with them so they can make plans about their life as they go forward. We've got both of those fixed. I want to make sure the team's aware of that. In addition, we have two after action reviews that are ongoing. We stood those up immediately the day after the storm got done. One is focused just on system technologies, the work that we need to do there to improve. The second's around our restoration planning. So how did we do with having resources planned ahead of time is we brought in the first wave of resources, the second wave of resources and how we worked through in our hardest hit areas, the equipment that we needed to be able to work forward with that. We plan to have those done by the end of the month and we'll make better improvements as we go forward. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to any questions for Tanya and I. Thank you both very much. <clears throat> Um, so the MPSC has talked a little bit about the um, the, the audit that's going to be coming down the line. Um, and so my question is going to be, do you think uh, here today, and then we'll want to look sort of after the fact uh, how this aligns, that your um, distribution system maintenance is going to be properly prioritized? Do you think yeah. that audit is going to going to validate that or are we going to have problems when that information comes first, in? First, we welcome the audit. Um, we do a lot of benchmarking with other utilities across the country. We're happy to have an independent party come in and work through that process, specifically go out in the field and validate with us. We expect there'll be some learnings from it. We welcome that feedback and that'll help us get improved at a quicker rate. Uh, Senator Shing. Thank you, and again, thank you to all the workers who were involved in getting the power back on. Um, one of my concerns is that many residents are extremely vulnerable. Um, they may have a CPAP machine, they, they may be in a, in, a, in a nursing home. And with repeated outages, um, I'm wondering if, if you have any kind of a plan to identify ahead of time the vulnerable people and make sure that they have um, backup generator or perhaps solar and a battery that they can flip over to support their household during a time of an outage so that they're not in danger. One of my huge concerns during this time was that if the, if the temperature went down that people might die. Not everybody in my district has the money for a hotel or a restaurant or, or some place to go. And so um, given that this situation seems to be normal, I'm wondering what your plans are to protect the most vulnerable in our community. Yeah, first let me start with if we're aware and we have a system where we can code if there's anybody that needs issues with they're on a breathing machine or CPAP machine or different items like that, 
We code that, we know that, we can help prioritize that as we go about our restoration. We also partner with communities to have warming shelters and make sure that we're supporting in that way so that those folks can get to a place that's free of charge for them to be able to get to and be taken care of during those times. Okay, I um, would just really appreciate knowing how that those decisions are made and how we can help you get that information or if, if maybe you're all set, but it didn't seem like it during the outage. We can follow up with you on that process for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hauk, would you still like to ask a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Nope. Um, I know that, first of all, I, uh, it's two part really quick. First of all, your main lines, do the utilities own the right of ways to trim underneath them? And then the second one is, I know that we want to go to buried lines, but in my township, it's amazing how many times other people come in and bore into stuff. So I think that's something that we got to watch out, because if you bore into a sewer line or a water line, that's just water. I mean, it's not good, but somebody doesn't have the possibility of dying. So I just want to know how you're looking into that. Yeah, I'll answer both questions. So first, we do own the right of way in most situations to be able to do that. Our tree trimming practices are a clearance around them. They're not what we consider ground to sky. So in an ice storm of this magnitude, anything that's not ground to sky trimming, those limbs are above our lines. They get the weight on it. They break, they fall through our lines. So we're looking at tree trimming practices as we go forward, but we do own the right of way in most situations on our main backbone lines for sure. For undergrounding, we're looking at a pilot. There's opportunities there for us as we go forward. As you've heard from others today, we're very interested in that. We have an underground workforce that we're scaling up right now and building to be able to work specifically with that equipment as we go forward. It's not an area of expertise for us on the electric system, but it's something we're definitely looking at. There's challenges. With underground as well, as everything goes under, there is risk from a safety perspective still where somebody could bore into that, hit an energized line to be an issue, but our systems are set up to safely de-energize at that point. Yeah. And the other thing is the amount of time it would take to fix that versus an overhead line. You know, I, yeah, but I'm sure you guys are looking at all. Um, Vice Chair McDonald Ribbon. I thanks uh, for your testimony today. Um, I'm glad you started. You talked about the workforce because that's where my question is. I know um, we keep hearing about these um, once in a lifetime, once in a generation events that seem to happen every two years now, and I am wondering how you think about and use predictive modeling related to weather and how that informs your workforce. Uh, decisions of you know who's working at what times, who's who 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 goes on layoff, who doesn't, uh, and if you thought that had any um, implication on your reaction times in these last two storms. Yeah, we use the models for both planned work and our long-term plan, but also for um, weather that's coming in, like the ice storm that we saw. So we work with a third-party DTN, we work with IBM, use their model, and then work with the National Weather Service. We have multiple calls a day leading up to events. For this event, as it got closer, every day it seemed to get more, um, more impact forecasted. So we ramped up the resources we would bring in. We had all 183 of our crews at Consumers Energy engaged and another 450 crews inside the state. And we brought crews from across the state line, even moved us forward when the second wave of weather came in and hit that Greenville Big Rapids area to bring an additional 100 crews in through our mutual assistance process. So we're continuously looking at that as we go forward. Um, back to our long-term plans, we've added 230 line apprentices over the last two years. We have plans to add 300 more. We partner with over a dozen community colleges that work them through the first 12 months of electrical theory. Here's what it's like to climb a pole. Then they come and work for us and we put them through a very robust training program. We have a world-class training facility in Marshall. We do a lot of great work. We have an internal climbing arena so they can get trained every day of the year, year round. So we are looking at that. We are finding challenges with being able to get folks that want to move into that. So I know there was a question asked, how can we help? We need some help getting our youth involved in those technical skilled jobs. We need to get more folks involved in that. There's a lot of opportunity. That's who's going to help build all of this work for us as we go forward. And I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but can you just talk about what the salary range of those folks are that you're desperately seeking for? <laughs> Yeah, we can follow up with you on that. If that's yeah, I, I, I just know that it is a really good paying yep. job. And yeah. so there's this, there is, there's a space to open up a line of folks that are desperately needed in really good paying jobs. Absolutely. Senator Bellino. No thank stories you. this time. Thank, thank no you, time. Mr. Chair. And I want <clears> to <throat> double up with what Senator McDonald Rivett said. Um, I have a nephew who's a lineman, and there was a forecast of a strong storm coming in at Christmas. 
So my nephew gets a call. Do you want to be on call? If you sign to be on call, we'll give you $5,000. And all these linemen signed up, and it cost DT a lot of money for a storm that didn't happen. But they had the people all lined up, and he was happier than a clam. He was at Christmas dinner. He wasn't working on a line, and he got paid for it. So thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> there wasn't a question in there, but that's okay. So. Senator Hertel. Uh, all, right. all right. Anyone else? I know time's close. All right. Uh, thank you both very much for being uh, in front of us today and for answering our questions. Certainly know that you're available to our members um, at any time. And this is, again, not the end of our conversation by any means. Thank there being no other further business before the committee, and without objection, the Senate Committee on Energy and Environment is adjourned. Thank you. No problem.